In June of 1980, two young women suffered a traumatic event in a carriage house in Galveston. One of them, the character Marty, moves to Austin. But the other one, the narrator Possum Fields, wearing a pair of riotously untied tennis shoes and a pair of warm blue pajamas, then walks and walks every night for the next 30-something years across the island. The island, she says, is a crescent moon fallen in the sea. And when she reaches the seawall, she stops. It's our most arresting construct, our seawall, she says, and sits upon a damp stone bench. By the time I reach my bench out here each night, she says, it feels like I'm wearing wet blue Kleenex. Before the word secession was a political word, it was a religious word, meaning simply to retire from the world, to refuse it. These fragments are from the five book novel, The Secession of Possum Fields. But about all possum, the narrator wishes to secede from is Texas. In fact, the opening words are, at night I take my bench out here and turn my back on Texas to say nothing of the whole North American continent. Not from any disloyalty, or maybe a little, it is just out here on the sea wall I am learning to overhear myself. Each night, sitting on her bench, she thinks about and tells stories about all that is lying behind her in the weirdly glowing dark. The sweet, crazy island, the wide, lapping bay, the oil world that is Houston, the life of the human beings and the critters during the oil century on, coast, on the coastal march of southeast Texas. This is from book three, The Price of Oil. You know the wetlands. The wetlands are where the cordgrass grows and the shrimp you had for dinner last night spawn, where hundreds of species of fish and crabs shelter and begin life, where the great airborne population of ducks and birds and geese descend in all seasons to set or land majestic and very still in the teeming shallows. For Southeast Texas and the island are where three continental flyways cross. But this rampant infinity of ducks and birds are, I should point out, migrants. Migrants make us unhappy in Southeast <clears throat> Texas. There's not a whole hell of a lot you can do about it. They've been flying in here and landing from Mexico and Canada, swoosh, swoosh, for 10,000 years since the last ice age anyway. In spring, millions of them. Sure, we've drastically reduced their numbers, torn up the coastal river bottom forest where they might rest up, nest, and mate. We paved asphalt parking lots and golf, golf courses. We've erected the largest petrochemical refinery complex on the planet, where for glittering dominant miles, it seems that the stars have shrugged, the sky has shrugged off the stars and a galaxy has fallen to the earth. We built asphalt parking lots and golf, we built condominiums and spas and glass pyramids over the squishy marshes where the birds comb the cordgrass for tiny speckled trout. They're really dependent, these birds. They have to be fed, habitated, it's a problem. True, the numbers are way down, but come spring, here they come anyway, born on the high air currents, desperate, forlorn, determined, it seems, navigating by the stars on a spring night. They fly five, six hundred miles. Here they come, the tragic multitudes, 39 million at last count, the tiny ruby-throated hummingbirds, orioles and tanagers, a magnificent frigate bird, green herons, great egrets, cattle egrets, snow egrets, roseate spoonbills, purple martins, a ubiquity of sparrows. Great crested, fly, great crested fly catchers. See how bad it is? Some deplete their tiny fat supplies, are so exhausted after the flight that they crash into the sea, but millions make it to the land or the marshes to collapse here, wings splayed, eyes out, wide open, immobile, as one veteran bird watcher put it. We keep an eye on our migrants, often using high-powered binoculars. Fall's just about as bad. Dozens of shorebirds, red-tailed hawks, white pelican, pintails, scop, red wings, redheads, widgeons, cormorants, black pellied plovers, teal, white-fronted geese, snow geese. Once they flew in unbroken canopies. A hunter standing in a rice field could not see the winter sky. So great were the migrations of ducks and snow geese. True, we've discouraged this prolific migration by, say, erecting subdivisions where the rice paddies or the marsh once held the land, but it's baffling they keep a coming. We're seriously thinking about building a wall. It'll have to be a very high wall. It's a real challenge, a can-do engineering miracle. We're up to it, a Corps of Engineers Bechtel and Halliburton Wonder Construction. Your average snow goose can fly at altitudes of up to six or 7,000 feet high. The flocks, high ghostly traces in the night sky, fly following the riverbeds to the sea. When they see the moon beaming on the bay, they turn back. The flocks slipstream into a turning V formation and spiraling into white funnels. They descend cloud after cloud to the land. This is from book two, Apprentice to Silence. I stole that from 
Sir Frank Kermode, who actually came here to teach. Two things, one, in the third decade, the two women, Marty and Austin and Possum, get cell phones, so they talk every night. The second thing you need to know is that in 2004, there was a huge surge in Iraq, and Condoleezza Rice said, who was then Secretary of State, said, it's not a surge. And they said, well, then what is it? And she said, it's just more troops. And to make it sound official, she said, they're augmented troops. Night, night, love you, love you, click, click. The antidote to loneliness is solitude. Marianne Moore was right. Even a mildly polluted solitude like this one will do it. Solitude and a cell phone. Solitude works even if you're only an old woman sitting in a pair of damp blue pajamas on an exceptionally damp stone bench. There's no real danger of me exaggerating the dampness of this bench, nor the dampness of these pajamas, nor for that matter the primordial and at the same time operatic dampness of everything else within about a hundred square, hundred mile radius of said bench. Here, the hinges of elementary school students' lunch pails rust. So do the trees. Here, the sky and the metaphysics mildew. Undergownments, no matter the fashion of the century that has lately seized this third coast wilt. And the dew-saturated flowers droop and wheeze worse than romantic poets. I mean, we've got tubercular, or maybe it's just asthmatic flowers. Here, our famous humidity makes slow preachers and politicians and the thieves, though it don't slow them down enough, don't even get me started. I've spent, 20, I've spent 31 years out here on watch. There's not all that much going on. Although in 1944, sitting right here, someone did spot a German submarine. Quite often, I just watch my shoelaces. Nightly, the loose shoelaces get picked up by our dependable and almost invisible southeasterly breeze. All moving elements here, water, air, undulate with the slick Elvis hydrocarbon sheen. The laces belly in the breeze like broken monofilament fishing line. Flapping aimlessly over the edge of the seawall, the laces wave, yoo-hoo, to the huge fat rat shadows animating the granite shards below. These granite shards were once torn out, quarried, if you will, from the hard, dry geological heart of central Texas, ferried in open railroad cars to the island, strewn seaward on the beach to protect the wall. After the great storm, raising the entire island and the building of the seawall were projects of Alfred Nobel, yes, the dynamite guy, and two retired generals from the Army Corps of Engineers, energetic, skilled, determined Victorian men who at the moment of their departure in 1905 stood for a satisfied ceremonial farewell moment atop the completed edifice, now dividing the ravaged pretty city from the sea. Though none of them were any longer wearing the Corps of engineer uniform, the khaki jodhpurs, the stiff brims, the knee-high boots. They were men of military be bearing. About face, the three engineers turned to pay their respects to the honorably defeated sea. Two fingers snapped to the brims of their fedoras, a gallant salute to the sulking, imprisoned enemy. Of course, the engineers were focused solely upon possible future danger and so missed entirely were clueless about our future graffiti. The seawall may be the world's largest chalkboard. Every summer for a hundred years, children from all over our state have stood on the green lichen slippery rocks and chalked their names into the concave face of the seawall. During winter storms, the waves, fussy as school teachers barge in, spitting in their lace handkerchiefs to erase the names. The stated purpose of this 60, now 90 block seawall and the rip rock rocks was to make us feel safe. Works for me, I'm, out, I'm committed to being out here every night no longer sure of the difference between the rhetoric of will and a pure imagination. While the shoe laces flap like tattered flags over the refugee rocks and the formidable rats and surging round them, the gentle slosh cycle of the lukewarm sea. When a wave good buddy slaps a rock, the waves delay the rat lying on the rock. The drenched creatures shake themselves. They're about as big as mid-sized Labrador retrievers. <laughs> In defense of the wall's intent, finally, I should say that sometimes we do get the low pressure. Up on the mainland, on the flat salt marsh prairie near here, where I was raised as, as the world, we could actually see to the end of it where the refineries began. When the world grew preternaturally still, my father used to study the barometer on the porch and come away his hands folded over his belly, solemnly intoning the low pressure. 
the low pressure is a pagan thing. And oh, it is fine down here on the island, the awe that surmounts the stillness, with only the manic, unmindful cicadas droning on louder and lighter. The wind does not then begin so much as scoffingly pre-exist, revealing itself and all its power all at once thunderously for us slow learners. From all directions, the storm arrives, its natural authority announcement enough, claiming that it has always been landlord of this sodden corner of the earth and this scrawny beach. That's when the fast dogs get up on the porch here on the island and for many nervous miles inland. My shoelaces just go crazy. Emboldened, the strings snap and whip at the heaving bruised wind as if the shoestrings could turn the thousands of white horses, the waves, the kipling ass charge out of the unlimited darkness, the shore fast disappearing under the pound of hooves. Although above hurricane force too, such storms do not really sound like stampeding horses. Strangely, the really great storms sound like howling human beings. All the same, the beach of the Berry Islands for 700 curving miles continues to erode, redepositing the island's sediment under the mythical hooves. This is all mined in 3D, as if an immense black drive-in movie screen has been stretched across the night sky and the white horses begin to charge magnificently out of an infinite dark. It's very much like the end of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I saw that movie sitting between my parents in the balcony of the El Capitan Theater in Pasadena, Texas in 1954, Glenn Ford, Lee J. Cobb. And I remember my mother saying, shh, possum, shh. And I remember the four horses and their skeletal riders, death, disease, famine, war. Out here during our storms, there are way more horses, augmented horses. I keep sitting out here and I don't get used to it. The erosion, the surge the augmented horses. Mm -hmm.